So, good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm Richard Fall, and on behalf of my co-chair, Norman Sharp, this is Norman Sharp, I'd just like to welcome you to this. This is our second public lecture in our 50th anniversary lecture series. Great provocative title, Heart Attacks and Stroke, Getting the Blood Flowing Again. So that's, that sounds pretty good. Um, as you all know, heart attacks and strokes they are two of the major causes of death and disability in our community. Great challenge. And tonight we've got three of New Zealand's preeminent experts in this area, and they're going to describe how these diseases develop and how they contribute to the health. And then they're going to move on to describe the recent huge advances in medical technology and um, use how the medical technologies use various techniques to restore blood flow and to get the heart and brain working again. Pretty good. So these developments have actually transformed the management of strokes and heart attacks and throw up significant logistical challenges. How are we going to roll this out right across the country? And they'll touch on that, I'm sure. So it's really important that we acknowledge the the support and the, and the partnership that these, these lectures are presented with in partnership with the Auckland Medical Research Foundation. And just before I ask Norman Sharp to introduce our first speaker, I'm going to ask Sue Brewster, who's the Executive Director of the Auckland Medical Research Foundation, just to say a few words. Sue. Well, thank you very much, Sir Richard. And it is my pleasure to reinforce Professor Fall's welcome to everyone here tonight and to our Auckland Medical Research Foundation guests and uh, supporters that come along to our public lectures every year and, um, and some of you will also be new here tonight. So uh, the first in the lecture series was held last month and yes, our public lectures this year in 2018 are a little bit different. This year, we have the privilege of partnering with the magnificent Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences in celebration of their 50th year anniversary. So over the last 63 years, Auckland Medical Research Foundation has provided significant funding into cardiovascular research. I think we've funded uh, research from the pioneering days of heart transplants and bypass surgeries right through to the modern day projects of technology assisted cardiac rehabilitation. Anything's possible. But we couldn't do this without the support of our amazing people who donate the money to fund our world class medical research. This funding literally provides the heartbeat, and there is no pun intended, for our extraordinary researchers, <coughs> many of them who work here at the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences. These researchers work tirelessly to undertake their life-changing research and provide the genuine advances in medicine and health that benefit us all. I'd like to acknowledge the outstanding calibre of our pre presenters here tonight, and I'm sure we're all going to learn a lot. So in closing, please do take the two minutes it'll take to fill out your feedback forms that are in the folders so we can cont continue to deliver all that's important to you. I hope you enjoy tonight's presentations and leave here with increased knowledge, not only of heart attacks and strokes, but also into how to get that blood flowing again. Thank you very much and enjoy. Good evening and welcome. What a fantastic turnout. As I came in the door tonight, uh, some bright spark who knew me from my former life said, oh, Norm, they've brought you off the bench again, knowing I'm a basketball fan, a Breakers fan, and you know what coming off the bench means. I said, no, mate, they've taken me off the shelf. But uh, <laughs> here I am. It's great to be with you, and what a fantastic attendance. I think that in and of itself speaks so strongly to the, the community of uh, the medical school in a broader sense in Auckland. At the outset, I'd like to actually acknowledge the founding members of the medical school in this 50th year, many of whom I knew well, working in Auckland as a young doctor at the time, having graduated from that southern school in 1968. Uh, I think it would be not unkind to call them collectively uh, a white-coated, hierarchical, but lively bunch, which they were, 
It was very much a former era in medicine, as you may reflect. But I do recall in the precinct here, between the hospital and the medical school, the sense of excitement with the first intake of 60 students and so on and so forth, and the traffic building up across the road, back and forth. And I think if any of the foundation professors were here in the 50th year, they would be very well pleased with what they saw. We should acknowledge them and thank them. Also, I'd like to briefly pay a tribute to um, Jeff Todd, Sue Brewster and the AMRF. Uh, more than $60 million invested in medical research in Auckland since the 1950s, since their inception. An absolutely fantastic contribution. And I think this in and of itself is a major factor or has been a major factor in uh, securing the school's current solid international reputation. Uh, finally, by way of introduction, uh, I have to mention the Hart Foundation. And it happens to be the Hart Foundation's 50th anniversary year this year too. The foundation being constituted in 1968, it was first suggested by the Auckland grandfather of clinical cardiology, Jim Lowe, taken up by colleagues in the main centres, medical and business people, I knew many of them. And through their vision and generosity of spirit, like, just as with the AMRF, the Hart Foundation came into being. And I think, if I can mention one person, that vision and generosity of spirit was epitomised in Auckland by David Cole, a cardiothoracic surgeon who was the second dean of the school for many years, a wonderful man. Of course, in the 1960s, coronary heart disease was epidemic. People were dying in the 40s and 50s. Frequently, it was not uncommon. And since then, coronary heart disease death rates have gone down by about three quarters as a result of education, prevention, and a revolution in clinical care. Uh, the aims of the foundation from the outset were to support research, education and, and more latterly actually patient support on a national basis. And the foundation has invested more than 65 million in research. Uh, this is in heart research nationally, biomedical, clinical and public health. And uh, this is in projects and people as the AMRF does so well. The, the fellowships in particular I think ha have been the forte of the Hart Foundation, uh, and uh, there are two endowed chairs, one in Christchurch and one in Auckland. The first chair in cardiovascular studies was endowed in 1987. Uh, some in the audience will remember Professor Willem Lubber, who took that chair as the inaugural uh, chair. It is now held in Christchurch by Mark Richards, a former Hart Foundation senior fellow, who has grown and developed his team efforts uh, and he now directs the Christchurch Heart Institute, which is a world-class research program bench to bedside and into the community. The second chair is with us tonight in the form of Professor Rob Dowdy, the chair in heart health. Um, Rob, too, was a former Heart Foundation senior fellow, appointed to the chair in 2011 and leading, uh, developing and leading a broad program, uh, again, uh, across the board, as it were, encompassing basic clinical and community-based research. So without further ado, I'll ask Rob to take us ahead and tell us about heart attacks and strokes. Rob. Well, thank you, Norman. Uh, Sir Richard, Sue, Dean, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And it really is my pleasure to be here to talk with you this evening. And my title is, is very simple. So I've got the simple bit. Um, and I was told to make this light-hearted just now, so I'm going to have to rewrite my whole talk for you, I'm afraid. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about what these things are, heart attacks and strokes. Um, I'm going to start pretty basic. Um, your heart pumps blood around your body, as you know, through your arteries and veins, and it delivers to our bodies um, the blood and nutrients and the oxygen that all of the tissues in our body need. So we're going to be talking about major places in the body supplied by some pretty important blood vessels, and you'll hear about the treatments um, that we're going to talk about in a minute. We term, medically, we term those conditions cardiovascular disease, um, and the main focus of the clinical events we're talking about are heart attacks and strokes, um, as you know them. So, <coughs> as we're sitting here, um, 
we're talking about the heart and your heart is quietly working away there. So here's a beautiful image of the heart. This is reconstructed from cardiac MRI imaging of the heart, um, provided to me here by Prof Professor Martin Nash and his colleagues at the Auckland Bioengineering Institute at this university. Um, really illustrating some of the technology we have to work with to understand how the heart actually works. So while we sit here for the next 90 minutes, um, your heart is going to beat more than 6,000 times. So in a room this size, we're going to share between us more than 1.2 million heartbeats. Um, while you're thinking about that, I'll carry on talking. <laughs> so it can be argued that we really live in very fortunate times. Um, as Norman's already mentioned, we've seen a 75 to 80 percent reduction um, in the risk of dying from heart disease and stroke over the last 50 years. A really remarkable story over what is a relatively short period of time of improving risk factors um, and advancing um, of treatment. We can also think ourselves fortunate we live in a country with a publicly funded healthcare system, um, and I'm not going to answer questions on that one. <laughs> we have incredible teams who are dedicated to delivering the very best in healthcare. Um, and many of you in this room may have experienced or been touched by some components, either for you and your families, um, for that healthcare. We have researchers of international standing um, locally here at the University of Auckland um, and in all areas from public health through to basic science. Um, the expert clinicians and their teams, both in the hospitals and the communities in this region, um, really are, again, of international standing. And we have sim similar clinical and academic excellence across the whole country. So we are in very fortunate times, I think. I'm going to set the scene, really, in the next few minutes um, for what you'll hear in relation to treatments and the advances of treatments um, for these common conditions, heart attacks and strokes. Before I do that, I'm going to take you back in time a little bit. So it's always nice to go back. It's the 50th anniversary, so we can look back a little bit. And for those of you who like history, um, then Dwight Eisenhower, you'll be very familiar, I'm sure, uh, he was the Commander General of the Allied Forces in Europe during the Second World War, um, and he was elected as the 34th, 34th President of the United States in 1952, at the age of 62. On the 25th of September 1955, he was playing golf um, in Cherry Hills Country Club. If you have a look at it, it's a very nice place. And he experienced some symptoms of discomfort in his chest. He was attended to by his personal physician, Dr. Snyder. Um, and Dr. Snyder stayed with the President overnight, administered a number of drugs, including some morphine. And if you're interested, there is a side story um, about Dr. Snyder, the personal physician. Um, and when you touch into that story, what I take away from it is I never, ever want to be a personal physician to a President of the United States. Um, there's a lot written about this gentleman. Twelve hours later, it was recognised this man was not doing quite as well. He was taken to hospital. An ECG was delivered into the hospital from somewhere else. Um, and that is a device that just simply records the heartbeat electrically. You can now record that on your mobile phone. Um, and a heart attack was diagnosed um, at that point 12 hours later. And you're going to hear um, from others about potential delays in treatment, delay in presentation, delay in treatment. He was treated in an oxygen tent initially and spent six weeks in hospital. Um, and we don't even truly know to this day um, whether oxygen is a good thing to give to people with a heart attack or not um, at that point. Now, the impact of this was huge. So in that um, era, there was uh, been a lot of strife over many decades. Um, and the day after the president's heart attack um, was the worst day in trading on Wall Street since the uh, end of the Second World War. The Dow Jones fell 6%. $14 billion was wiped off the, the, the share market at that point simply by one person's heart attack, one event. The president did survive his heart attack, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, he went on to have a stroke two years later. We're going to hear about heart attacks and strokes more um, as we progress the next few minutes. Um, and he survived another seven heart attacks. He survived 14 cardiac arrests um, until he finally died at the age of 78 in 1969. So quite a story um, for one person um, who's been touched by cardiovascular disease. Um, and you'll probably note that most heart attacks are not followed by the same impact on the share market as this one was. <laughs> we'll also just pause and go back a little bit um, um, to that era, um, because that really is an era where heart disease management was starting to change. Um, and we're going to talk about this again a little bit as we go through. But as you'll be aware, people with heart disease, people with heart attacks, may die suddenly, and they may die very quickly from that problem. 
and they die because their heart stops beating, as we call it, ventricular fibrillation, the treatment and management of which is resuscitation and defibrillation. So the first successful resuscitation of a patient was undertaken in 1950, 1953. Um, and Dr. Zoll, whose name persists um, associated with defibrillation 50 years on from there, undertook the first external defibrillation of a patient um, in 1956. <coughs> a British cardiologist, we have to get back to Britain at some point, um, Desmond Julian, recognised around that point um, and presented at the British Thoracic Society the need for monitoring of patients um, and the need for monitoring very closely of people who are having a heart attack and who are presenting to hospital uh, and the need for resuscitation if the heart rhythm becomes a dangerous heart rhythm. And this was published and a year later in Kansas City in Bethany Hospital, an 11 uh, bed unit funded by private donations from a New York foundation was opened um, as the first coronary care unit as it was recognised at the time. And coronary care units, as I'm sure you're all aware, are a fundamental part um, of heart attack management in all of our hospitals um, 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 in, the, in, in the world. And Dr. H. W. Day in the early 70s in a paper, perhaps this quote from the end of his paper really sums up that era that the 60s had been the era of the cardiologist with the defibrillator in his hand. I won't go into the wording of this obviously. Um, I'd argue that actually probably it was in other people's hands and probably the nurses in the coronary care units overnight actually too. Um, but it was a point, the point is, it was resuscitation era. It was early development of, of, of advanced care um, and resuscitation. So very basic care, but this is 50 years ago, um, and you'll hear um, others um, as we progress come back to the themes that, that are still there and still present um, for how we treat people with heart disease. It is the 50th anniversary, um, so let's go back to 1968. So this is an extract from the New Zealand yearbook from 1968. Um, and that was then the New Zealand population of 2.7 million people. Um, and this is a, ta a figure there. I think this was a hand-drawn figure rather than some fancy Excel or other <laughs> program plot um, of showing that the major causes of death in that era of heart disease and cerebral hemorrhage, um, cancer up there as well. But the major causes of death um, identified at that stage even 50 years ago. The population was different as well. So here are population graphs of 1968 with the different decades of our age um, and how that's changed. You can see visually there um, with the baby boomer population now moving through middle aged and also the advancing age of our population. So not uncommonly people surviving through into their 90s or the hundreds um, and still experiencing cardiovascular disease and all the challenges of management um, for people of advanced age. So a lot has changed, a lot is the same, but a lot has changed um, over that 50 years that we're talking about. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about what heart attacks are. I'm gonna talk about the potential causes, um, which hopefully will round this up and lead into some of the advances in treatment. So we're talking about blood vessels. We're talking about blood vessels blocking and those arteries blocking, um, affecting the major organs in our body and the, the clinical effects uh, from those problems. We need to understand those blood, ve blood vessels a little bit more um, to understand why these processes happen. Um, and this is atherosclerosis, and I'm sure you're all very familiar with this process. <coughs> Lots of different terminology, as we have in medicine. Medicine loves to have four or five names for the same thing, um, uh, and we all choose to use them in a different way at a different <coughs> time. But atherosclerosis, plaque in your arteries, hardening of the arteries, whatever you like to call it. And there on this illustration here on the left hand, um, is the is a, is an illustration of an artery. It could be any artery in the body, um, but there's the plaque-laden deposits building up in the wall of the artery. You need to consider this over a lifetime. Uh, this is, doesn't develop over weeks or days. Um, um, this is a process developing over a lifetime, um, and I'll come back to that theme in a minute. And this will progressively potentially narrow an artery, um, and this can affect a number of different places in our body. So it affects our heart and our brain. We're talking about that today, heart attacks and strokes. But it affects other areas in the body as well. It affects our legs um, from the point of view of the circulation to the legs. It affects our gut, and that's often forgotten about. It can cause substantial symptoms for people. And it affects our kidneys. Um, and kidney problems and kidney failure um, are, remain to be an important problem. These all develop, all of this atherosclerosis develops on the background of risk factors over a lifetime of exposure and probably before we're actually born. 
So let's think about the heart for a moment, a heart attack. Um, so here's um, a CT scan. These are images de derived from a simple X-ray, very fast X-ray, taken with no catheters inside the body. These images provided to me by my colleague, Associate Professor Malcolm Leggett. On the left there is the heart with the coronary arteries running around the outside of the heart. And then with rendering of that image, the heart itself is removed on the right-hand side, um, um, uh, uh, not from the patient, but from the image, <laughs> um, leaving the coronary arteries for you to see there. And you can see they're very small. These are arteries only a few millimetres in diameter. Um, but as I've talked about, they're doing that function of supplying the nutrients to the heart muscle every single time the heart muscle beats. So it's no wonder that we run into a problem uh, when one of those blocks. And so they do block. And these arteries block at the site of one of those narrowings most commonly. So in the heart, a heart attack is caused where the artery inside is rough and friable and blood clot forms at the site of that plaque in the coronary artery. And the blood clot then forms to block the artery. This is a sudden event. And if you talk to people who've had a heart attack, it's often out of the blue. Um, so it doesn't come with warning symptoms over weeks or months. It will happen out of the blue. The situation with a stroke also relates to blood, ve to blood vessels and to blood clots. And for some of those, as you'll hear from Professor Barber, those blood clots come from other places in the body to lodge and to block in a crucial artery um, supplying the blood to the brain, causing a stroke. So do these heart attacks and strokes matter? Well, let's step back and think from a global perspective, first of all, they do matter. Um, so the World Health Organization, as I'm sure again you're very familiar, um, talks of non-communicable diseases now as being our major challenges ahead and has done for some time. This is cardiovascular disease, this is cancer, this is respiratory disease and diabetes. And cardiovascular disease, <coughs> lumping together heart attacks and strokes, um, is a major cause of death around the world. So you can pluck all sorts of figures, but 18 million people dying a year from cardiovascular disease or one heart attack and one stroke occurring every 40 seconds. So I don't know how long I've been talking for, but already we're clocking through the heart attacks and strokes as we're talking today. In the United States, one in three people die of cardiovascular disease. It's also important to remember we shouldn't just be focusing on the death rates from these problems. People survive and live with heart disease and survive and live with the sequelae of a stroke. Um, and so, for example, here it's estimated that more than 90 million people in America alone are living with heart disease um, for the years ahead. So very important implications um, um, in relation to patients. So does it matter in New Zealand? Yes, it does matter. But this is the great news story, which we've already mentioned, the substantial reduction um, in the death rates from heart disease and stroke over the last 50 years. So the peak in those graphs, um, the peak in the graphs is in the late 1960s. So that is 50 years ago. So it's quite appropriate to be talking about this on a 50th anniversary. So it is an epidemic, as Norman has already mentioned, um, and high smoking rates risk factor management, all evolving and then changing over that time, resulting in these substantial reductions in the risk of dying of these two common problems in the last 50 years. Fantastic, great news, incredibly important, um, but there is a lot more to understand and a lot more to be done um, for these two common conditions. So it is still highly relevant in New Zealand, heart, heart disease and strokes. So they're the second and third leading cause for why any of us in New Zealand will die. Um, incredibly important, and that's following on from all cancers lumped together. You can see the numbers there for the estimate of the number of people living in New Zealand with heart disease and living with the effects and disability of a stroke. So these are large number of people um, in our population living with the effects of these conditions. But let's think about things a slightly different way as well. And heart disease and stroke account for more than 10% of all illness, disability and premature death in our country. So again, very, very important identifiable causes um, for disability. And this is not just a problem of older age. It's often still thought that, ah oh, well, heart attacks are only what pe affect older people, we're all going to die of something anyway, so really let's just get on with thinking of other things. That's not the case at all. So heart attacks and stroke affect younger people. So let's think of working age people below the age of, say, 65. So one in three people with a heart attack are of working age and one in four people with a stroke. 
Um, so these are affecting people, perhaps in their prime of their life, making huge contributions to their family, their whānau, um, and to society in general. So the implications here um, are broad, and we could go on and talk about that in great detail um, um, at another time. We need to consider the inequity that is still present in New Zealand, and here I've just selected to illustrate this um, the age of onset of these two common conditions. So you can see here that for Māori and Pacific, the average age of onset for a heart attack or stroke is substantially less than for New Zealand European people living in the country right now. Um, and however you cut the statistics, however you look at it, Māori and Pacific people do much worse for their heart disease, stroke, and as they do for many other conditions. Um, and we need to recognise this and obviously a lot of work is going on um, and should go on to address these inequities. These problems happen because of common risk factors, and these risk factors have been known about for a long time, but there's a multitude of risk factors. Um, it's right from birth, so it's the, the world we're born into, it's the families we're born into, it's housing, inequalities, deprivation, it's our education, and then it's personal factors about us that we take through our lifetime. So this is a lifetime concept in relation to cardiovascular disease. Physical inactivity, and you're probably all now thinking right now of your children or your grandchildren who you're still telling to get off PlayStation and go outside and be physically active like you were. Poor diet, smoking, these problems are still very prevalent in our society. How do we deal with this though? How do we integrate all this information to understand this? This is uh, a huge amount of information for us to integrate individually at any point in our life course to understand what our potential risk is. And I really just want to pay a, a, a tribute and acknowledgement to Professor Rod Jackson at this university and his wide team um, out in the university and outside of the university who've been involved um, in this um, work in relation to understanding how to predict our risk of heart disease by integrating that information for us as an individual. It's getting to the level of precision medicine, where we can understand about us, not just as a group of people, but us as an individual. And this is a publication from just last week in, in The Lancet um, of the data that's been derived from 400,000 New Zealanders. This is decades of work in understanding how we can actually predict who is going to be at risk of developing a heart attack or a stroke over the coming years. The challenge now is to implement this, it's to actually use this to actually um, appropriately manage people who are at high risk, advise people um, and take this forward through that life course. Um, and this, as I say, this is decades of research. This may look relatively simple. This is decades of research, huge amount of funding, funding and a very broad um, research platform to be able to achieve um, this kind of result. Um, that can now be used in clinical practice. We should talk a little bit about good news. So the New Zealand Health Survey from the Ministry of Health from last year has some good news in it. So all of you, 80% of you, um, you can all stand up if you're one of these 80%, 88%, thought your health was good, very good or excellent when you answered the health survey. Um, so that's pretty good, isn't it? Um, smoking rates are decreasing. That's pretty good too. So we should probably just stop here and then go home and have dinner and pat ourselves on the back. But it's not all good news, is it? And this sort of information is, is really crucial, contemporary information that we can take forward and do something different with. 600,000 adults in New Zealand still smoke regularly. 1.2 million adults in New Zealand are obese, and that's a third of the adult population, and another third are overweight. So that's two thirds of the population that are overweight or obese. 100,000 children are obese. Um, and all these factors, as we put in that life course of disease, are incredibly important for the risk of heart attacks and strokes. If you look at the richest homes that children are born into, maybe 3% of those children will be obese. If you look at the poorest homes, at least 20% will be obese. So we live in difficult times and a lot of difficult challenges to grapple with. This is from the, the front cover of The Economist 15 years ago. So this isn't just from a few months ago, and we're still talking about the same things, and I think really illustrates and captures the attention very nicely. And then there's practical problems um, that really are quite frightening. So in this survey, 
when people answered questions about picking up prescriptions, that we have to go to a pharmacy and pay for the prescriptions or get to the pharmacy to then pay for our prescriptions, a quarter of a million adults didn't pick up a prescription within the last year. So they had sought out health care for a problem that was identified that was considered to need a prescription of a drug, a prescribed drug. And that's a quarter of a million adults didn't pick up those prescriptions. That's pretty shocking and pretty bad when you think of the long-term implications um, um, of what that does. So I'm going to finish just with symptoms. And if you bang your head tonight on the cupboard before you go to sleep, you're going to know what happened and your head's going to be sore. If you catch your thumb in the door, your thumb's going to be sore and your thumb's going to tell you that your thumb's sore. Heart attacks and strokes don't work like that. Um, it's difficult for people to recognise that they may be having a heart attack. It's difficult for people to rationalise what's going on. And there's a multitude of reasons why people may not recognise and may not do something about those symptoms. Um, and I just really want to pay a tribute both to the Heart Foundation and to the Stroke Foundation for major in initiatives um, for heart attack awareness here illustrated, as I'm sure you've seen, with television adverts and posters. Very, very effective um, television advertisements and some lovely stories came through, I think, um, almost immediately following those um, of people who had responded because they'd seen the advert. So these sort of activities make a difference. And here, the FAST acronym for recognising um, the signs, the symptoms and signs of a stroke. And the common theme, these are medical emergencies. You need to do something about this. This is not sitting around for 12 hours with your personal physician at your side overnight thinking that things might get better. You dial 111 and you go to hospital. So I'm going to end here and I would like though to pay a tribute to all my colleagues, my academic colleagues in the broad university sense, the clinical colleagues, the public health physicians um, and the many, many patients who've contributed to the research um, that you'll hear a little bit more about. Um, that's contained within the data, some of the data I've already presented. Um, we have a huge willingness in New Zealand for people to take part, um, doing this for all sorts of regions, many of which are altruistic. Um, and we live and should respect that, and I really do take my hat off to people um, contributing to the research uh, that goes on. I enjoy working in this field in this country. It's a challenge. Um, but I think we're actually at a very, very exciting point. You could say the 50 years, each of those points have been very exciting. I think we live in a very healthy environment across the country um, to be able to grapple with and address some of these important issues. I will also thank the Heart Foundation. Norman has already mentioned this, but I'd like to extend a thanks to the Heart Foundation really on behalf of everybody who has b benefited from the funding. That's 1,400 project grants, individual ideas that have made a difference. There's more than 200 people being touched by fellowships. Um, and all of those then snowball um, and continue. And that's a lot of work and a lot of funding um, that really has seen this through. It's a team effort, and the Heart Foundation has been part of that team for the last 50 years. Also like to acknowledge the Met Auckland Medical Research Foundation for the funding um, 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 to medical research um, in this region and obviously for supporting the series here. Thank you. It's a privilege to, to introduce Jerry. He's a senior cardiologist uh, in Waikato Hospital, and um, he's led unprecedented improvement in clinical care in that region, which I would be so bold as to suggest is perhaps the most challenging geographically and demographically in our small country. Uh, he's the former chair of our Cardiac Society and honorary associate professor in the University of Auckland and currently medical director of the Heart Foundation. And having heard about heart attacks and strokes, Jerry will now tell us how we treat heart attacks. Thank you, Jerry. took half of my slides, I'd be one and a half some of my time off. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to talk not so much about what's new and how we treat heart attacks in this world. We've been treating heart attacks the same way 
for the last 30 years with uh, clot busting medicine and stents. So I'm pleased to see the neurologists are finally catching up. They're usually about 10 to 20 years behind what we do in cardiology. Um, but our challenges in New Zealand is how we improve care for everyone in New Zealand. As Norman mentioned, I work in the, the Midland region. It's a very geographically diverse and challenging area to deliver health care. And we are passionate about equity, equity of care for New Zealanders. Um, as Norman mentioned and Rob mentioned as well, this is the 50th anniversary of the Heart Foundation as well. Uh, uh, formed in 1968 by Sir David Hay and like-minded people. At that stage, there was an epidemic of heart disease in New Zealand. One in two New Zealanders smoked. 40% of our diet involves saturated fats as part of our diet. We've had a dramatic reduction in cardiovascular events, ischemic heart disease deaths since then. Half, half of that's been due to preventative measures and half of novel treatments that we, we now have available to us in New Zealand. Um, Rob took us through some of this, but just to emphasize, way back in the 1940s, you come in with a heart attack, you may as well toss a coin whether you survived or not. So if you survived the heart attack, you were likely to die of a clot somewhere else due to prolonged bed rest uh, with the clot going to the lungs. Um, in the latter days, in the 1980s, we had the year of clot busting medicine and then we started putting stents in in the 1990s and some of the some of the pioneering work that's informed what we've done over the years has been um, supported by heart foundation research in this new zealand uh, some of professor sharp's work looking at ace inhibitors um, after a heart attack and people with heart failure um, one of my colleagues in waikato dr chris nunn he um, in 1996 he came back to waikato having been in florida on a douglas white fellowship where he uh, learned primary angioplasty and waikato was the first unit in the country where we perform primary angioplasty when someone came in with a heart attack 24 hours a day. So again, supported by the Heart Foundation. I want to share with you two, two patients uh, and two, two slightly different stories. Rose is a 71-year-old lady who lives in Manukau. And Eddie is a 78-year-old man who lives in rural Taranaki. And they both present with chest pain with similar ECGs. Does so somebody want to have a, one of the physicians? Philip, would you like to interpret the ECG? Do you remember how to interpret ECGs? OK. OK. And what would you be considering at this stage? OK. Yep. So when we see people present with chest pain first question that we ask and it's why when you go to a doctor's surgery with chest pain there's a sign up in all doctor's surgeries or ed departments please come to the front of the queue this is what we want to know whether you're having one of these events which is a large heart attack where the artery one of the arteries usually in a, in a large vessel and the proximal vessel is completely blocked and that increases your risk not not only of sudden death but also more permanent damage that can lead to heart failure. So that's what we want. We want to diagnose that quickly to get on with strategies to try and open up the artery, to reduce the likelihood of sudden death, and also to preserve heart muscle in the longer term. The sooner we do this, the better. And that's a picture of an artery um, that's been explanted from someone that had a heart attack. But what you can see here, there's a lot of clot in the artery. The plaque is actually ruptured, and that artery would have been closed completely. And what we do know, we are much more likely to achieve benefit in the longer term by opening up the artery as soon as possible. So the sooner we can get on and make a diagnosis, we can get on and administer treatment to try and open up the artery. If we can put stents in, we should get on and do that. And the rationale behind that is we get greater muscle salvage. So we're going to open up the artery. But we're more likely to get sustainable flow to the artery compared to clot busting medicine. That results in less recurrent angina, less heart attacks, and we avoid the life-threatening complications of some of the clot busting medicine that we give in New Zealand. This is one of the complicated flow charts around what we actually do. So someone presents with chest discomfort here. What we want to do is find out, again, make a diagnosis early. And if you can have an angioplasty or a stent put in with 120 minutes, 
from when you first see someone at first medical contact, you should get on and put a stent in. However, if that cannot be achieved, patients should not be denied clot busting medicine. Okay? So that's a really important thing for us in our treatment paradigms. And this is similar. We've got a similar uh, diagram flowchart to this in New Zealand, but this is the, the latest ESC guidelines. So again, 120 minutes is the sort of cutoff that we start considering. Should we, if you can get from somewhere to somewhere else that performs angioplasty within 120 minutes, then it's reasonable to try to transfer that patient to the angioplasty center. If you cannot, you should not deny that patient clot busting meds. If we look at what we're doing currently in New Zealand, and this is from, two, this is from uh, 2013, about one in three New Zealanders receive clot busting medicine, about 40% of New Zealanders um, receive angioplasty, but about 20% of New Zealanders receive no form of treatment for a blocked artery when they present with a big heart attack. If you receive no treatment, you tend to do worse, self-explanatory. You tend to, um, these patients tend to be more likely to be females, nursing home residents, and if they are admitted to hospital, they tend to not receive the same treatment on discharge. So they, you, do not, you do not do well if you do not receive um, either clot busting medicine or angioplasty. So getting back to our patients, Rose, her pain onset was at six o'clock. She drove herself to Middlemore Hospital. Um, good idea, Philippa. Arrived at 11.30, was transferred from Middlemore to Auckland Public, arrived at Auckland Public at um, half past midnight. That's her main artery down the front of the heart. It's blocked high up. And she gets the artery opened up with a stent seven and a half hours from symptom onset. What about Eddie? So Eddie had two previous heart attacks, so he's, he sort of thinks he knows what's going on. Uh, he awakes at 12.50 with his chest discomfort, dials 111. The ambulance gets to him pretty quickly at 1.40 a.m. He arrives at Taranaki Emergency Department at 2.30. He gets given his clot busting medicine fairly quickly at um, just after 3 a.m. Two hours 20 post-symptom onset. So again, Getting Eddie from Taranaki to Waikato, which is the nearest um, angioplasty center, that's not going to happen within two hours. So his treatment's appropriate, so he should be given clot busting medicine. And we'll talk about, we'll just see how this develops. So, again, if we look at the evidence around clot busting medicine, it works. It works well, particularly if it's given early but the risk is bleeding and bleeding into the brain, which is serious and can occur in up to 1% of patients. So that's the risk we expose people to when we give clot busting medicine. But again, we should not deny people with a serious heart attack clot busting medicine if they cannot get to an angioplasty center within, 100, within two hours. So back to Eddie. It's 5 a.m. He's got ongoing chest discomfort. His ECG has not changed much at all. And he's referred to us, we get a phone call on a typical foggy white cattle morning. Say, so, can you help? So what Taranaki want to send him up to us to consider an angioplasty at this stage. So he arrives at white cattle at 10 a.m. And again, the guidelines would say, this is the current European guidelines, once you receive clot busting medicine, you should be transferred to an angioplasty center immediately. Okay? So not sit around and wait to see if the artery opens up or if the artery does not open up, because we cannot predict that at all well. And we know that approximately one in three blocked arteries do not open up after being given clot busting medicine. Now, uh, Alan, that's a lot of clot in that artery. I don't think you'd be keen to try to suck that. So that artery there is full of clot, okay? All the way down there. But this is Eddie's angiogram. So he comes to our cath lab, uh, arrives at 11.30 a.m. Oh, I'll go on to the next one. 
and the artery responsible for the heart attack is stented and opened uh, just before midday. So again, if we look at what happened to Eddie, he arrived at the scene, the ambulance arrived, taken to hospital, he's given the clot busting medicine, he's transferred to Waikato when things don't look as though they're going well, finally arrives at Waikato and gets his artery opened up 11 hours from first medical contact. Philip, have we done him any good? Probably not done a lot of good if you think back to you know, the, the myocardium and the time. So how might we improve uh, time to treatment? So lots of efforts over many years have gone into what happens when someone comes through the front door trying to streamline things. We're now starting to look at what happens down this end. So how can we improve getting patients to recognize the symptoms sooner? Can we bring the treatment forward to the patient? By that, the ambulance can do an ECG. We've, get the, we've got the technology now where an ECG can be done on an ambulance, sent to someone in the emergency department, um, a heart attack diagnosed, and decisions made about giving treatment at that stage, whether it's clot busting medicine or going to an angioplasty center. We're able to collect data in New Zealand about what's happening. We're fortunate we've got a large uh, registry that allows us to see what's happening to people who come in with heart attacks, or suspected heart attacks across our country. And we're able to look at a number of things, and this is looking here at uh, time to giving clot busting medicine. And what we can see here, I'm not sure how well this projects, but where the clot busting medicine is given pre-hospital, again, it's, it should be a no-brainer. If you can give it uh, in the ambulance, it's going to be given, you're going to achieve the timelines, and the recommended time is within 30 minutes out to 60 minutes sooner. But as you can see, there's a lot of variation still in delivery of uh, clot busting medicine in New Zealand. Rescue angioplasty is what we uh, talked about with Eddie, been sent to us in Waikato. You can see there's a lot of variation here as well, but the median time is just over five hours to get in the artery opened up. So again, the reason I show this is just to emphasize the importance of data. If you don't measure what you do, you, can, you don't understand what we can do to try and improve things. It's important that we do continue to collect data. And we can drill this down into each region, each hospital as of what's going on locally. So if we go back to Eddie, Eddie really should be transferred immediately to a PCI capable center after commencing the clot busting medication. We also need to look at developing systems of care that support early diagnosis and rule in treatment. Remember I said about one in five people do not get treatment when they present with a heart attack. We need to actually, why is that? They don't understand why that is. And develop systems that support early diagnosis and early treatment where appropriate. Not everybody's gonna be eligible for treatment, uh, be it clot busting medicine or angioplasty, but we need to support that decision making uh, earlier. And we now are fortunate, we've come together with St. John's, the Cardiac Network, which I also chair, and the Cardiac Society to develop a national uh, STEMI pathway uh, that recognizes this and recognizes the importance of getting people from A to B quickly and making the decision sooner rather than later. So again, if you look at what we want to do with Eddie and what the pathway helps, helps us to achieve, we hope, so again, that's how he was treated. What we want to do is make the decision to give us treatment when the ambulance picks him up. So can they get on and initiate treatment in the ambulance? Yes, no. There's no point in him going to Taranaki. Taranaki is not a place we can do angioplasty in, so he should be, he should be transferred to an angioplasty capable center. We're not saying he would necessarily go to the cath lab to have a stent put in the middle of the night. But if he needs it, he's in, the best he's in the best place for us to make that decision. So again, that's just emphasizing components of the pathway. So we're saying patients should be transferred as a routine. Logistically, this is going to take a little bit of while for us to work through in New Zealand, but it's something that we are aspiring to. And again, the important thing is all of us working together with St. John's now as well. So trying to align all our systems. What about Rose? So her archery was open seven and a half hours from first symptoms. Alan? 
good, bad? It's not bad. Rob, good, bad? Not good enough. It's not good enough. I think, so again, if you go back to what we were talking about earlier with that flow chart, when she hits the medical system, things move through pretty quickly. Um, what she did wrong is that she waited. And it's not uncommon for people to wait because they don't know, as Rob mentioned, that, that, you know, it's not, not every, most people do not have a classical symptoms of a crushing elephant on their chest. So it's very, it could often be very vague trying to work out what's going on. But if we look at delays to treatment um, today, delays attributable to the patient, so not quite knowing what, what's going on, accounts for up to two thirds of the time before we get on and open up the artery. More likely to arise in older people, women, uh, people with diabetes and patients of lower socioeconomic status. And public health campaigns are really important to try and increase awareness. Um, this is our last campaign with the Heart Foundation. We ran it again last year. We will run it again this year. And what, what you see here is that uh, pre-campaign, St. John's call-outs increase during the campaign. And there's a legacy effect for a period of time afterwards. The problem is that it doesn't stay. You've got to keep doing the campaigns. Also, uh, and Rob alluded to this, let's not forget that one in 10 people with ischemic heart disease, blockages in the arteries, their deaths occur outside hospitals. So what else did Rose do that we, we, we would advise her not to do in the, in, the, in the Heart Foundation campaign? She drove herself, didn't she? Yeah, so that's why do we recommend dialing 111? So it's to get prompt access to the defibrillator, yeah? So if she develops a, a, a rhythm problem, it can be recognized and treated quickly. And what we have seen, uh, and this is again data from Anzac QI, I'll bring you over to the end here, comparing 2015 and 2016, patients with heart attacks arriving by ambulances, they have increased slightly over that time period by about 6%. So again, it's, an import, it's imp small but important. Finally, just to mention um, Good Sam. Anybody heard of Good Sam? So Good Sam's an app that's available. It was launched at the resuscitation meeting in Wellington a couple of weeks ago. We all can sign up for this. I think it's important that we all consider signing up for this if you know CPR. We, in New Zealand, we need to become a community of lifesavers. If you have a cardiac, if you have a cardiac, out of hospital cardiac arrest in New Zealand, you've got just over a 10% chance of leaving, leaving hospital. Um, what's, what's gonna save more people's lives is people knowing CPR and knowing how to use an AED, where the AEDs are. Good Sam helps alert, you know, if it's, if it's an arrest outside here and you sign up to Good Sam, Good Sam will notify you can you come and help? It will tell you where the nearest AED is. So I'd encourage you to have a look at this on the, either the, app, the Apple Store or Google Play. And if you know CPR, please consider signing up for it. Um, finally, just to mention journeys, uh, sharing stories. We found this really powerful and emotive with, on the Heart Foundation, real people sharing their own stories to help and support others. So if you haven't looked at the Heart Foundation website, I'd I'd recommend you have a look at the journey section. So Norman, I'll finish up there. And thank you very much for your attention. Just to top the evening off, we're going to go to the brain, of course. And um, the final lecture this evening is presented by Professor Alan Barber. Alan's the clinical leader of the Auckland City Hospital Stroke Service. And also is the Neurological Foundation of New Zealand professor of Clinical Neurology in the Department of Medicine at the University of Auckland. So Alan, um, he's one of our preeminent neurologists and stroke specialists. He graduated from Otago and completed his neurology training in Auckland in 1997. He then went on to the University of Melbourne and um, did his PhD there in 2000, graduated in 2000. His thesis, which is going to be touched on tonight, of course, is the fact that he looked at the role of advanced imaging techniques in identifying patients with the potential to respond to acute stroke therapies. And after he returned to New Zealand in 2001, established an international leading stroke unit at Auckland City Hospital, 
and um, he was appointed to the um, Neurological Foundation Chair here in 2008. And as you'll hear in his talk tonight, he's uh, an innovative and leading researcher. He's focusing on the use of advanced neurophysiology and MRI imaging techniques in stroke. And he's got a very engaging topic tonight, um, pulling out clots to treat strokes. Alan, over to you. Right. I feel a bit vulnerable being the only neurologist in this crowd <laughs> up the front. So I'll just get my talk up. It's great to be here talking with you uh, tonight, and um, I'm going to talk about stroke. But let's figure out what we're talking about. A stroke is a sudden onset of a focal brain deficit caused by a problem with the arteries. That's why it's called a stroke. You get struck down. The symptoms come on almost immediately. And the arteries either block in about 80% of the cases, or they burst in about 15 to 20% of the cases. And I'm going to talk about the blocking sort of strokes, ischemic strokes. So we've heard a little bit about atherosclerosis, and uh, atherosclerosis occurs in the heart arteries, but it occurs elsewhere, and it occurs in characteristic places. And one of the characteristic places is in the carotid artery, just in here. Don't feel them both at the same time. <laughs> and where the artery branches, there's turbulent blood flow, and you get an atherosclerotic plaque laid down. And it's, but this is a characteristic place for the plaque to be laid down. And you can see these in life. This is an angiogram. These are the vertebrae. There's some fillings and teeth. <laughs> this is the carotid artery. This is the internal carotid artery. It goes straight up into the brain. And you can see, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that's not a good thing. Okay? So that's what we would call a critical stenosis. And blood can clot and block that, and all sorts of terrible things can happen. So they account for about a quarter of strokes, and the other, another third of strokes are due to embolism from somewhere else. And the usual court, uh, site of embolism is the heart. And the most common cause of emboli is a fibrillating heart. And if the heart's fibrillating and not pumping, clots form even on the inside of the body. And if they get big enough, they can break off, they can go anywhere in the body, but if they go to the brain, they can eventually get to an artery that's too small for them to go any further, and they block it off, and you're in big trouble. And this is a little cartoon. If you watch down here, this, that's a clot. These are the arteries supplying the brain. That's the middle cerebral artery, supplies most of one half of the brain. The clot comes up, it's too big to go any further, the brain downstream around that clot dies pretty quickly. But all of this brain further out is getting reduced blood because over the top you're getting collateral flow from the other arteries that's coming around the, to try and keep the brain alive. Unless you break this clot down very quickly, that infarct core, that stroke gets bigger and bigger, and that happens over a few hours. And so, like the heart, you've got a few hours in which to do some good. You know, and you've seen this tonight already, and to be honest, if you remember nothing else from my talk tonight, remember this, remember fast. And I know, I know most of you have probably heard this, but people don't know what strokes are. If you have chest pain, you're a middle-aged man, you know you're having a heart attack. I know there are, there are difficulties. If you wake up in the morning and your arm's numb, you know, people often think, well, I've just slept on it funny. They don't go to the doctor. And... Uh, you know, that, that can be a problem, or their hand is weak and they're just not sure what's happening. Now, big strokes, people get to hospital pretty quickly, but these smaller and medium-sized strokes is a big problem for us. So, if someone has something suddenly, because strokes get struck down, they had some sort of funny turn, think fast. And so, get the person to smile. If one side of their mouth doesn't come up, that's a clue. Now, there are other causes of an uneven smile, <coughs> uh, but they come on more slowly. 
Okay, so if it came on suddenly, that's a clue that it may be a stroke. Get them to lift up their arms. If the arm's paralysed, that's pretty obvious. But if it drifts down like that, they might be having a medium or small stroke. And then get them to say something, because uh, language, um, in most of us, sits on the left side of the brain, the, the part of the brain that looks after language, and if that's been affected by the stroke, the person may not be able to understand what you're saying, or they may not be able to express what they want to say, or the muscles that make your speech may be weak, and they've got slurred speech. And the T is for time, and that's the reason why, and, and Jerry sort of alluded to, th to this, is that you've got a limited amount of time to do something before it's all over, before that infarct core has expanded and the stroke's as big as it's going to get. Okay? And look at the watch to, so you know what the time is. Okay, so how do we treat stroke? Well, when I was a junior doctor, which doesn't feel that long ago, uh, but strokes were the last, people with strokes were the last people seen on the ward round. They were usually clerked in by the medical students, and you saw them last on the ward round, and they were in the corner, and that was because there was nothing that you could do, apart from good nursing care and uh, physio, occupational and speech language therapy. Um, and since I was a junior doctor, things have changed, okay? And as difficult as it is to um, agree with Jerry, he's right. We're 10 to 20 years behind the cardiologists. Uh, we have known that since 1993 that stroke units, for every 18 people you treat in a stroke unit, compared with a general ward, one more survives and is not disabled. Having said that, We've only had stroke units in our hospitals, in all of our big hospitals, in the last five years. It's taken that long to get stroke units in all hospitals. A single aspirin for someone having an ischemic stroke, for every 100 people you treat, you prevent one from dying or disability. So it's not the best treatment in the world. You've got to treat 100 people to save one, but it's very cheap and very effective. We've known that giving Alteplase, the clot-busting drug, we still use alteplase, but we're going to start using tenecteplase because the studies are coming. But anyway, so uh, we're following cardiology again. <laughs> Giving alteplase into the vein, clot-busting drug, uh, we've known since 1996 that that's effective. But still, only about 10% of people with stroke actually get it in this country. And that's not unusual around the world. But what I'll probably talk around about the most is clot retrieval. So this is going in and fishing out the clot, and this is really exciting. After this big desert with nothing happening in stroke medicine between 1996 and 2015, we've now got something we can do, and it's for the biggest strokes, the ones that are the most devastating. So that's really exciting. So um, this is a case of mine. Mr A, um, the initial's been changed, and that's not his age, <laughs> but you get the idea. 64-year-old... Uh, was getting ready for work. He's got a background of high blood pressure. He stopped smoking six or seven years ago. He'd been up, had a shower, and at tw 20 past seven in the morning, he had the sudden onset of right-sided weakness such that he fell over, and he had slurred speech. He got to hospital just over an hour later, and he had no movement or feeling on the right side of his body, and he couldn't speak at all. So right-sided body, the left side of the brain looks after the right side of the body, so he's got a problem on the left, the left hemisphere, parts of that part of the brain, looks after your language, and so he's got what we call a dysphasia. This is a big stroke. This is a scan, and uh, these, these are the temporal lobes, so under the temples. These are his eyes, okay? It's pretty cool, eh? That's, the, that's his lens. That's the nerve that goes fr uh, from the back of the eye to the brain. And these are the muscles that actually move the eyes. Anyway... These are the arteries. Okay, that's the middle cerebral artery on one side, and that's the middle cerebral artery on the other side. And when you're looking at a scan, when I'm in here lecturing students, look for the difference between the two sides. And this artery is nice and juicy, and this artery stops there. Can you see that? And that's a clot. And so this is his angiogram, so we get a little wire, sort of probably a little bit thicker than that. You can't even see that, but a little bit thicker than that. Maybe that. Feed it up through the femoral artery. This is actually the catheter. You can see it here. Can you see that? Squirt, die, and take x-rays as you're going along. Sort of like, exactly like the coronary angiography. 
Um, this is new for stroke, so we're really excited about it. <laughs> this is the middle cerebral artery, and look what happens. It stops dead. This is a skull. Can you see that? Just I don't know if you can see that, but there's nothing. There's no blood flow there. That's a big problem. This is a massive stroke. These are the biggest strokes you can have, and a significant number of people with a stroke like this die, maybe 60, 70 percent, and the rest of the people are left disabled. These are the biggest strokes you can have. This is um, uh, a perfusion study. This is some of the advanced imaging. This is where there's reduced blood flow. That's almost half his brain, and that's going to die in the next uh, few hours, probably in the next six hours. Now, we've got the clot-busting drug, but this is the problem with clot-busting drugs for big strokes. This is what we show patients when they come in, we, a little pictogram of these are the benefits and the risks. These are 100 figures, and for every 100 people we treat with the clot-busting drug for stroke, we help 13 really well, they go home basically normal, and about a third of people we help, or they go home normal, we actually harm three because you cause bleeding. You open up the clot, the brain's dying, it's all mushy. That's not a medical term. And <laughs> if you open up and restore blood flow, you can get bleeding into the brain. And so for every 100 people we treat, we cause bleeding in three. The cardiologist, you cause it for every 100, it's one, but it's for us, it's three. The problem with alter plays is this. Two-thirds of the people it has absolutely no effect on. And the reason why that is, is because it's no good at dissolving big clots. Um, don't have to worry about these, these are the different arteries, but for Mr. A, I know that when I start that infusion running into his vein, there's only a 30% chance it's going to open up the artery. There's a 70% chance that it's not going to open up the artery. And that, trust me, that makes your heart sink. So it's effective, but it's not particularly effective and it doesn't dissolve big clots. So for a long time, we've been looking for ways at trying to open up clots. And we've tried suckers, we've tried corkscrews, we've tried everything. And uh, we were involved here in a large um, Australasian uh, stroke trial, uh, where basically all the, all the stroke doctors in Australia and New Zealand took part. And it was one of five international studies that all were published at the same time testing what we call a stent retriever, which is a little bit of chicken wire, um, very fancy and expensive. And what you do is you feed it up, you get your catheter up through the femoral artery, squirting dye so you know where you are. This is the middle cerebral artery stem. This is where Mr A's got his clot. And unlike previously, where we used to nibble at the clot and suck the clot and corkscrew the clot from the proximal end, from the, this end, with this technique, you actually go all the way through the clot and then you open up the chicken wire stent coming back. And so that means you're not pushing the clot further upstream and you're not breaking bits of clot off going upstream. And then once you've got it like that, you pull and suck and you can convert a patient like this to this. Okay? So that's the, that was the artery that was blocked and you've restored the blood flow to most of one half of his brain. And you just hope it was soon enough to prevent that infarct core from having expanded too much. This is the clot. So these, that's fingernail. So this fingernail's about a centimetre. That's the little chicken wire stent. This clot's two or three centimetres long. And it's not a surprise that the clot-busting drugs don't dissolve that. It's just a big clot. And by the following day, he'd gone from being paralysed down the right side, not being able to speak, to having mild right-sided weakness. He went home after four days, and when I saw him for follow-up at three months, he was normal, back at work. He had a 60 to 70% chance of dying and an almost 0% chance of having a good functional outcome, and he would have still been in hospital at three months. Um, so that's endovascular clot retrieval. So how are we doing? So this is brand new. This is really exciting, OK? And so far, we've treated 310 patients in New Zealand. Most of these are in Auckland, but Christchurch is ramping up. They've done 50, and Wellington's done a few, and they're ramping up. 
Uh, people are about 64 years of age. Our eldest person is 92. We don't have a, a age cutoff. If the 92-year-old is driving and delivering meals on wheels, she gets the treatment. Um, slightly more men than women. And these are the number of cases. So this is a good example of taking part in research improves clinical care. So we're bouncing, these are the numbers of people 2011 to today. And we're bouncing along on the, the bottom. And these are the people that were in our trial. Um, and there aren't that many of them, but it meant that uh, here in Auckland, we were hit ahead of the pack in the world because we took part in the trial. We know how to do it. We're experienced with it. And we're now, our trial and the other four trials were published at the same time in 2015. The numbers have taken off. And this is where we project at the, the end of this year, and it'll be double that next year. Okay? So exponential growth. So this is right at the big, this is hot off the press. Um, and we're one of the more active centres in the world. So how do we do? This is for the cardiologists. We call it a ticky score. <laughs> Not a Timmy score. And we open about 85, 87% of um, the arteries, either completely or near completely. And if you don't open the artery, the brain's going to die. Okay? Um, and so the ability to open up 80-odd percent of the arteries, as opposed to 30% with a clot-busting drug, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> that was... <laughs> That was not intentional. <laughs> so how good is it? It's really good. It's really, really good. And these are the biggest strokes. These aren't the small ones. Do you know about the concept of number needed to treat? The number, need of, number of people you need to treat to get something. Okay? The number needed to treat to see a significant improvement is 2.6. So for every two and a half people we treat, we see a significant benefit in one. And by significant benefit, I mean moving someone from private hospital level care to rest home care, or from rest home care to going home but needing help, or from going home and needing help to being independent. So a shift of one point on that scale. So for every two and a half people we treat. For every five people we treat, one goes home normal, that wouldn't have. And for every six people we treat, there is one less person who requires uh, long-term hospital level care. So, back of the envelope calculation, the 200, 310 patients we've treated. So far, there are 130 odd who are significantly improved. There are 62 more people who are independent who wouldn't have been, and there are 52 people who have avoided hospital level care. And talking to hospital, I hope there's no hospital managers here, they're only interested in this figure. <laughs> hospital level care is at $100,000 per year for the rest of that person's life. So they like that because if there's 52 more of them, you, you add that up, it's a lot of money saved. So how do we do this in New Zealand? Well, timing is everything. You know, time is brain. The sooner you start treatment, the more likely this is going to work. It's technically challenging. You need a highly skilled team. And at present, there are only three places in the country that can do it. So this is like cardiology 20 years ago. Um, and so we do it at Auckland, and we do it in Wellington, and we do it in Christchurch. And we have piggybacked on the cardiac uh, experience with flying people up and down the country to get their heart arteries opened. Um, and so these are helicopter flight times. So the patients we've treated here at Auckland, a significant number of them have come from outside of the Auckland metro area, Northland. We cover Taranaki. We had our first patient from Hawke's Bay in the weekend. Um, and similarly in the South Island, Christchurch provides a service. So as I said, when I started, uh, uh, when I went off, to, when I was trained to be a neurologist and I said I wanted to do stroke, um, uh, my senior colleagues thought that that was fine, but I'd have to do something else proper as well. <laughs> <laughs> because there was nothing that could be done about stroke. Um, and uh, over the years, you know, we followed behind the cardiologist with the stroke units, the clot-busting drugs, and now uh, with uh, stent retrieval, pulling out the clots. This is really exciting. I mean, this is just fantastic. We're only just starting. We're only doing the big strokes at the moment, but I've got no doubt in the next few years we'll be going into smaller and smaller arteries. These are drain pipes compared with what the cardiologists are doing. 
And so in the next few years, we'll be going into the branches, smaller and smaller branches, and treating patients with stroke like this. So I will stop there, and thank you very much for your attention. Well, it's 8.30 exactly, and I'd like to do just two things to wind this up. First of all, um, thank you as an audience. I think it's been a, practically a full house, and you've been wonderfully attentive, very patient, and the questions have been terrific, indicating your close attention. I'd rank you above any sort of average class of medical students for attention. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't mean that really. Um, but uh, on your behalf, uh, to thank uh, the sponsors, as it were, AMRF and uh, Heart Foundation and others, but particularly the speakers, I think you've heard three superb presentations tonight. Those are all state of the art, believe me, and I'm just going to thank them personally. I've been contemplating for the last half hour whether I should really sample these, uh, the contents of these boxes before handing to them. But I'll, 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 I think I'll leave that. Just please, as we finish up, show your appreciation for these w wonderful presentations. Really, very <laughs>